So this is uh, Courthouse uh, 101. Uh, and this is, I'm Jonathan Briggs. I'm the assistant law librarian in the Fort Bend County Law Library. Okay, so let's get started because we've kinda, only got a short period of time uh, in this. Um, we've got about 40 minutes or so in this class and I wanna get started. So Courthouse 101, uh, this is uh, part of our Pro Se uh, Basics series where we cover some topics uh, that are of interest, uh, we hope, to people who are representing themselves uh, primarily in, in various civil matters here at the Fort Bend County Justice Center. Um, we've got several topics that we generally do on a rotating schedule. Uh, we've got about eight different classes covering some different things. Um, this is sort of a general introduction to civil litigation and the, uh, hold on, let me admit the person, uh, to civil litigation uh, in the, uh, at the Fort Bend County Justice Center and the interaction uh, with the law library uh, and what we can do. Hold on one second. So anyway, we talk, we talk about various topics. Uh, Courthouse 101 talks about civil litigation in general and an introduction to uh, that topic. And Courthouse 102 gets a little more detailed in about some issues in handling your own legal case. You know, now that you're in a legal case, sort of what are some of the nuts and bolts uh, of it and what are the materials that we have available to you to assist in that here at the law library. Uh, we do courses on the state probate, uh, family law. There's a part one and part two of that course since it's such an expansive topic and a lot of what uh, pro se folks uh, are dealing with uh, here at the law library. And when I say pro se, uh, that means you simply represent yourself. It's a Latin term meaning for oneself. Um, we also do a course on legal research. Uh, I think there's, that's a part two course. So we do them about, uh, these courses come up about once every couple of months on a rotating schedule. They're essentially the same from, you know, time to time that we obviously try to update things and keep them, uh, you know, as uh, fresh as possible. But it's, you know, some pretty standard courses that we do on a rotating basis to, you know, inform people uh, of these basic topics. You know, as law librarians and law library staff, we can't give legal advice, but we can point people to materials uh, that can assist them doing their own legal work. And we've got a lot of stuff here. Um, I'm gonna kind of go through, I'll, I'll email uh, the, a copy of this PowerPoint presentation to everybody uh, a little bit later today afterwards. So I'm gonna skip a few things in the interest of time, but it's a, a, you know, it's a fairly detailed PowerPoint. And so uh, kind of go through it uh, on your own time as well, and maybe see if there's some things of particular interest to you. Um, like I said, my name is Jonathan. And uh, this is my contact info here, uh, our address and phone number and email and so forth. You know, we're, we're not currently open to the public at this time. You know, we're kind of a limited opening. Um, you know, we're open to uh, attorneys can come in on a limited basis and county staff. Um, like I said, we can't give legal advice, but we're glad to help as much as possible because we know what people are dealing with when they come to the courthouse are things generally very serious to them. Um, you know, we're going to talk about just kind of introduction to civil litigation. You know, what if you become involved in a case, either as a plaintiff or a defendant, um, and, and sort of what are some of the general lay of the land here, just to familiarize yourself with it, because it's usually pretty new to people. Uh, like I said, the Courthouse 102 class uh, involves kind of getting into a little more detail uh, about maybe carrying on a civil case of some sort and some of the things that we have that can help you do that. You know, the law library uh, is part of the Fort Bend County library system, the general branches that are out in the neighborhood, such as in Missouri City or Fulcher or Needville. Um, you know, there's 11 branches, I believe, and, and we're one of them. We're a little bit different in that we're a reference library only, uh, though, uh, you know, so we don't lend books or anything like that. And we're inside the courthouse. So uh, we're run a little bit differently than the other ones. We're run with some input from the uh, uh, judges and, uh, and other folks that we have a, a law library committee that, uh, you know, governs some of what we do. Uh, you know, it's an excellent law library. It's, uh, it's, uh, hold on a second. It's uh, not funded through taxes, actually. We're, we're funded through fees that are paid. When you file a divorce lawsuit, let's say it costs around $300 and we get a portion of that. So, you know, uh, 
it can max, max out pursuant to state law at $35 per one. So we get that money and we use that to build our collection here, pay our employees obviously, and uh, you know build up a really good reference collection for people and other uh, services here at the law library. Um, you know, we've been around for just over 30 years now. Like I said, this kind of talks about some of our, our law library website and our other courses, and we have a Facebook page so you can keep up with things like that. Uh, we also have a newsletter. Uh, if you'd like to receive a copy of the newsletter, let me know. Uh, you'll get my email when I send out the uh, uh, PDF or the uh, PowerPoint to you as well. So if you'd like to be a recipient of our newsletter, we send that out once a month as well. It's just a little four page PDF. Um, so let's kind of jump into it here. We talked about representing yourself as a pro se person, uh, representing uh, as opposed to having a lawyer. Uh, cases are generally either criminal or civil. Obviously criminal, uh, self-explanatory. Uh, civil is basically everything that's not criminal and can cover several things. Uh, criminal, you're either charged with a felony or a misdemeanor or a combination of those things. Felonies being the more serious crimes, misdemeanors being the more minor crimes. You know, punishments can range from obviously the death penalty all the way down to uh, just a minor fine or something like that. Um, you know, here at the law library, we don't deal a lot directly with uh, people who have been charged with crimes simply because they are represented uh, either through their own attorney that they hire or uh, through the indigent defense office. Uh, on the criminal side of things, since your freedom is in jeopardy, it's uh, mandated by the Constitution and the cases interpreting the Constitution that you have to be provided with an attorney uh, You know, if you can't afford one. We've all heard the Miranda rights things on you know, police dramas. Uh, and so you know, we deal a lot with their attorneys. They come in here and utilize uh, our resources, but you know, in a general sense, we, we don't deal with the you know, criminal defendants much. We mostly deal with people handling their civil uh, matters. One thing, a couple of things we do help uh, people who are on the criminal dockets is uh, post uh, sort of in the aftermath of uh, maybe getting them, helping them with expunction paperwork or uh, orders of non-disclosure, maybe some issues with getting, uh, trying to get out of uh, probation early. So we do a little bit of direct con uh, contact, but mostly we deal with people handling stuff on the civil side of things. And so the civil side of things is family law being the largest single part of civil uh, law that we deal with. It's, a, it's an ongoing thing here. Uh, you know, it's not just divorces, there's child custody and support, and it doesn't it doesn't end really until the kids are, are grown, uh, until they're legally adults. So it, it can be an ongoing issue. You know, we have folks who are somewhat regulars here at the uh, law library, at least for a while, because they're dealing with ongoing family law issues, either a, a divorce case or the aftermath of the divorce. They're having to enforce uh, custody and support issues, or they're trying to modify those things. So, you know, you could feasibly have somebody who might be involved in the legal system uh, for their family case for you know, upwards of 18 years, maybe, you know, say if you get a divorce when the child's two years old, you know, you're going to be at least under the jurisdiction, continuing jurisdiction of the family law district courts for the next 16 years. Uh, hopefully nothing much has to happen, but, you know, the, the family law courts keep plenty busy here, and that's a lot of what we assist people with. Uh, you know, civil law also covers probate. Uh, that's the, you know, the, the aftermath of a loved one's uh, death, and you're dealing with uh, their estate. Uh, or the planning for that eventuality. And that's something that a lot of people are gonna deal with in their lives. You know, we, you know, it's, uh, you know, sometimes people think the law doesn't really touch them much, but you know, family law, a lot of families go through divorce and other issues. And a lot of people have to deal with the estate and probate issues, whether it's planning for their own uh, estate and will or dealing with uh, the aftermath. Uh, juvenile law uh, is another part of it. And then there's just the general civil law. You know, personal injury actions, car wrecks, and breach of contract cases, you know, suits between people, suits between businesses, uh, eviction cases, things of that nature. Uh, you know, we have many courts in this building. I can't remember exactly how many, but there's eight district courts, uh, and those uh, uh, cover both the, there's the family law courts, which are three of them, and then there's the general civil and criminal courts, which deal with sort of, like I said, the general civil actions and the criminal docket. And their jurisdiction, uh, you know, depends on things such as the monetary amount and controversy in a civil case, uh, or the subject matter of a particular civil case, uh, or handling felony cases uh, in the district court level. 
like I said, there's the family law courts and there's three judges that handle that. Uh, and they're those three courts, the elected judges are assisted by their uh, um, associate judges who are appointed to assist with that docket. So there's six full-time family law judges uh, in this courthouse and they, they keep plenty busy. Uh, you know, they're the, like I said, the presiding judges are elected as uh, all judges are in Texas. And then the associate judges are appointed for a certain term. Uh, the county courts at law, uh, there is sort of the, uh, there's six of those here. Uh, they're also assisted by, I believe, three uh, associate judges, and they handle uh, a variety of cases as well. The misdemeanor criminal cases, they are the original jurisdiction for probate matters. So, you know, if you're uh, probating a will uh, or doing some other type of probate case, uh, small estate affidavit, things of that nature, or guardianships, uh, those are handled uh, by the probate courts. Uh, and civil suits uh, with a mountain controversy ranging from 500 to $200,000. So there can be some overlap on uh, jurisdiction for civil cases, such as a personal injury case. Uh, you can maybe file both in either in the uh, county court of law or the, the district courts. Then there's the justice courts, uh, also called the JP courts or the small claims courts. And those have their particular jurisdiction. Uh, there's four of, no, there's five of those. Uh, spread over four precincts. And they're more, uh, I'm not going to call them the neighborhood courts, but they're not all down here at the Justice Center here in Richmond. Uh, there's one across the street in its own building. That's Precinct 1, Place 2. Uh, precinct 1 is out in Needville. Uh, precinct 2 is in Missouri City. 3 is in Katy. And 4 is in Sugarland. And uh, each of these courts that I've talked about, the district courts, the county court of law, and the JP courts, they're assisted by clerks, the district clerk, the district courts. The uh, county clerk, uh, the county courts of law, and then the JP courts have their own clerks. And these are, into, these are folks that handle the paperwork and the service of lawsuits and so forth. Um, you know, justice courts, they handle uh, their jurisdiction uh, is uh, several different things. Evictions, uh, uh, that's where they start. If you're gonna evict somebody, you gotta start in the JP courts. They have uh, small claims cases. So if your small claim uh, is worth $1 to $10,000, Say you have a you know a, a beef with a contractor who you know is going to you know remodel your kitchen for six thousand dollars and and they don't do the job right or there's something something wrong you could maybe sue them there or uh, those kind of cases small claims uh, it's going to go up actually the amount of controversy I believe is going to go up in September to twenty thousand uh, dollars just recognizing uh, inflation uh, you know a small claim ain't you know ten thousand eight dollars dollars ain't what it used to be. So that's going to uh, uh, change uh, in the next uh, few months, I believe. So obviously, I kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier about the impact of uh, the coronavirus issue. Obviously, lots of things are being impacted and the, the administration of justice is, is one of those. Uh, obviously, the courts are still in operation, uh, but they're trying to do things on a modified basis, uh, trying to do things more via Zoom hearings, uh, do complete some things via paperwork instead, via affidavit in lieu of a hearing. Uh, so it's a, it's kind of a, it's changes from time to time. And, and as things uh, go on, it's sort of a, a kind of got to update yourself regularly on how things are going. You know, there's really not any jury service going on. I think they brought in some small pools for jury service. I think there may be a few cases that have to be tried, can't wait any longer. But in general, there's, you know, there hadn't been jury service. And Last time I looked, I think jury service might be starting again in August, but as, as we know, things have kind of uh, uh, regressed as far as uh, our progress in getting past the coronavirus. It's uh, boomed again. And so, you know, that could change. Uh, so the, obviously there's websites and so forth to look at. The district clerk is the office that uh, organizes jury service. So you might want to check their website if you're interested in that. Um, like I said, it's, it's uh, impacted. Oh, let me go back to the courts one second. Uh, so the courts still have some in-person hearings. Uh, it's not completely gone. Obviously, there has to be some provision for that. There's things that just have to be done in person. Um, obviously, there's protocols for that. You know, probably, you know, this building requires masks at the moment and distancing and so forth. So there's some logistics in setting up all this stuff. And so, you know, checking your court's website for the details of how they're uh, handling their procedures with each court is something you're going to have to do. Um, like I said, we're, we're here to serve you. Uh,
people, uh, general public can come to our door and we can assist you with forms. I'm sorry it has to be that way at the moment, but all the library road branches are physically closed and we're one of those. And so we're trying to do what we can uh, to still assist people via uh, in person at the door or via phone or email. Here's our general uh, phone number and general email. And then my uh, particular contact info is also in this PowerPoint. Um, you know, trial by jury, uh, it's an essential function uh, of democracy and is very important. And obviously it's somewhat suspended at the moment. Uh, let's hope we get back to the normal operation as soon as possible. And you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, maybe never come to the courthouse except for jury duty. Uh, and, you know, I guess generally that's a good thing if you can avoid coming, but, uh, you know, a lot of people are going to be impacted by uh, the law and uh, being involved in a case at some point in their life. Um, you know, how do you become involved in a lawsuit? Uh, you know, you might be sued. Uh, you might need to sue somebody. Uh, you might be charged with a crime. Uh, you might have a uh, probate issue going on. You might be involved in a family law case. You might be bringing a divorce. You might be uh, the subject of a, you know, you might be responding to a divorce or some other type of family law action. You know, we've all heard the terms plaintiff and defendant. Those are generally the plaintiff brings the suit. Uh, the defendant, you know, is, uh, is on sort of defense. Uh, you know, it generally starts with the filing of a petition uh, with the appropriate clerk's office to initiate a lawsuit. Um, like I said, these are kind of the various cases you can become involved in. Um, in a divorce case, the terminology is a little bit different. The person who files for a divorce is called the petitioner. The person who is uh, the responding spouse is the respondent. Uh, in a criminal case, the state of Texas is the named plaintiff, state of Texas versus John Doe. You know, uh, that's how those cases are styled or how they are uh, named. Um, in a, like I said, in a family law case, petitioner, respondent. Uh, and it doesn't put you in any better legal position, whether you're the person filing for divorce or uh, the responding party. Uh, doesn't, you know, the court doesn't look at them any different. Sometimes, you know, the petitioner kind of is maybe driving the bus a little bit more, uh, sort of, a, you know, directing the litigation, maybe a little bit more than the respondent, but the respondent can be proactive and, and, and do what they need to do uh, to or party to a case. So just some differences in terminology. Uh, I've kind of probably said the term jurisdiction uh, already here. I wanted to clarify what that means. Jurisdiction means the power for a court to hear a case, and that is based on the subject matter of the case. So a divorce case, uh, a district court uh, has jurisdiction over that. Uh, divorce cases are not handled in the county court of law. So that's the type of court that handles it. In a Texas family district court uh, obtains jurisdiction uh, pursuant to the law, the rules. Uh, if you want a Texas a divorce in Texas, you have to have lived in Texas for a certain period of time, at least one of the parties, for the state to have a legal interest in uh, hearing your divorce and granting your divorce. You know, why would Texas care about somebody who, in a, in a manner of speaking, who lives in Oklahoma or New Jersey? You know, you're not living, you don't, nobody lives here. We're not involved, but once you become a party, once you become a you know resident here uh, for a sufficient amount of time, now the state has an interest in hearing your case. Uh, so that's kind of the subject matter jurisdiction. Jurisdiction also uh, covers granting, getting power over the party. Uh, you have to be brought into the case to for the court to assert power over you, personal jurisdiction as it's called. So I'm the petitioner in a divorce case, well, I, I, you know, I'm acquiescing to the jurisdiction of the court. I'm asking for the court to have power over my divorce case by filing that case. Uh, and then getting jurisdiction over the responding party has to be done through the service uh, of the lawsuit in an appropriate manner. The papers getting to the respondent in an appropriate uh, legal manner for the court to obtain power over that respondent as well. Uh, so it, it's, you know, there's some particulars in how that is done. Uh, venue, the, on the other hand, is the county where uh, suit is filed. So there's 254 possible venues in Texas, and there's rules about venue for governing various types of cases. It's in Chapter 15 of the Texas Civil Practice and Remedies Code, which we have here at the Law Library in many different formats. And so, like say, venue in the county uh, is similar to the jurisdictional power. You know, Texas has jurisdiction uh, via uh, a person being a resident of Texas for a certain period of time. And same thing, Fort Bend County has, say, in a divorce case, 
you know, has to have the, one of the parties filing in Fort Bend County has to have lived here for a certain period of time for venue to be proper here. If I live in Harris County, my ex-spouse to be lives in Wharton County. Well, and, you know, I can't file. It's not appropriate to file in Fort Bend County. You know, it's, it's not anyway. So uh, how do you then uh, get a person to uh, become a party to a lawsuit if they're the respondent or the defendant? You know, the petitioner or the plaintiff files that lawsuit. Uh, then they have to uh, get the other party served. And that involves the issuance of citation uh, and service of process. Uh, citation is simply a legal notice from the clerk, uh, what, no matter what clerk it is, you know, informing the party that they've been sued and some of the deadlines involved in responding to the suit and so forth. So it's, it's clear notice, you know, from the clerk that, hey, you've been sued and, you know, here's some parameters that you uh, need to be aware of uh, to act in response to the suit. Uh, so the whole sort of the package of the citation along with, say, the petition is delivered to the person and that process of getting that to them is called service of process. Uh, so oftentimes a traditional way of doing that is, uh, you know, say in a divorce case, you know, uh, the clerk will issue the citation and provide to the appropriate sheriff's or ca uh, constable's deputy to come out, knock on your door, serve you with the papers. Obviously, there's some other means of doing that, but then you know, once you've, uh, that's called service of process, getting the legal paperwork to the appropriate party in the appropriate manner. So it can be done different ways, you know, in-person service service by certified mail, service on the Texas Secretary of State, on a registered agent. It kind of depends on the nature of the defendant. You know, if it's a corporate defendant, you know, it'll probably be on the registered agent. If it's on a partnership, it'd be probably on one of the partners. If it's an out-of-state company, it might be served via the Texas Secretary of State. If it's a natural person, it's probably just gonna be in-person service or maybe by certified mail. So there's, there's different ways it can be appropriately accomplished. Uh, sometimes in a divorce case and other family law cases, uh, kind of given the nature of the relationship of the parties, there's the ability to forego formal service by executing a waiver of service. Uh, sometimes people can't be found uh, or people are not going to answer their door, let's say when someone comes around trying to serve them. So there's some other means to get them served, such as by publication or posting or substituted service. So there's, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Uh, and so it just kind of depends on the circumstances of what you'll have to do. Um, so, as I, and I've said this with a couple of different slides here is a bit of an admonishment to, not admonishment, it's just, you know, advice, I guess, in, in a manner of speaking, not legal advice, but general advice is, you know, don't ignore stuff that comes to you. Uh, otherwise, you know, it could have, you know, consequences on you. Uh, and I know it's, it's not fun to deal with things, uh, you're not fun to be sued, not fun to have to deal with this paperwork. It's a complicated enough world and then you're sued or something like that or have to be involved in a case. You know, you got to you gotta respond. Um, and Otherwise, you know, things can go wrong for you. If you don't respond, you probably know what's going to happen. Things are not going to go generally in your favor. Um, you, know, you know, so th there's certain deadlines you might have. Say when you've been served, you have a certain amount of time. And this paragraph here talks about uh, you know, the general notice you're given that you have been sued. Uh, you have a certain amount of time to respond, lest you be subject to a default judgment. Uh, like I said, default judgment, you don't respond at a certain point in time. Uh, in a certain circumstances, the court can basically say you lose automatically. Uh, so obviously, and you, that can be undone, uh, but it's difficult and it doesn't always work. Uh, so you might end up having a judgment against you uh, if you don't respond. Uh, you know, generally what a person or a company or somebody who's been sued, uh, the response to a petition is called an answer. Uh, we have forms for standard answers, uh, basically sort of denying the charges and, or saying at least the very least the plaintiff has to prove all their elements. And so it preserves your right to uh, defend the case. Uh, and and if sometimes defending the case might mean trying to resolve it, but you're, you're, you're in the case, you're defending it, you're not subject to a default judgment. Obviously, there's some things in addition to filing the answer uh, can come up if you need to contest jurisdiction or venue. If you're saying I wasn't properly served or this isn't the appropriate jurisdiction to, to have the case, you can file certain types of motions and stuff. So uh, there's some issues besides filing the general answer that you might need to be aware of. 
you know, from the get go that have certain deadlines and stuff that if you don't assert those types of things immediately, you lose the ability to do so. So if you want to try and transfer venue to another court or make a special appearance contesting jurisdiction, that has to be done at the outset. Um, let's see here. Anyway, uh, this just kind of, and just read through this uh, slide yourself. Uh, just kind of talks a little bit more detail about answers and so forth, some things that might be needed. Sometimes uh, certain types of answers have to be sworn to, uh, and these are in the rules of civil procedure. There's certain affirmative defenses that you can assert in your answer. In addition to the general denial and pursuant to Rule 92, you might have to assert some affirmative defenses, such as uh, statute limitations is an affirmative defense. Uh, so there's just some, there's, you know, in addition to the general answer, which, you know, covers, you know, probably most people most of the time, but there might be some other issues to deal with when you're, uh, when you're dealing with an, a lawsuit that has been served on you. You know, if you're dealing in a personal injury suit, I always kind of remind some, I've had to remind a few people, they come in and say, hey, I've been sued uh, for this car wreck case. And I'll say, just, I'll say, hey, do you have, you know, liability insurance as, as you're required under the law? And they're like, yeah. I said, well, you need to report that to your insurance company and pass the suit on to them. They will, uh, you know, probably be required to provide a defense for you. So uh, sometimes you might, you know, be provided counsel in certain types of cases where you have insurance, either your auto policy or your homeowner's deal. Like I said, just be, be reactive, be proactive. Uh, you know, you got to handle your business. And, uh, and if, you know, it's, it's unfortunate sometimes to be involved in these things, but uh, you got to deal with it. And we have materials here that will hopefully assist you in that manner. Um, you know, being pro se, you're, you're your own attorney. You got to do it. There's a lot to know, unfortunately. There's a lot of deadlines and rules and, and so forth and, and ways of doing things. And, um, you know, if you don't do it, uh, you have a good chance of losing that. Uh, so we have, you know, it's a lot of material, but we have the materials here. We have the rules and the you know, rules of evidence and rules of procedure and, and, and books about the practical application of the law, you know, how do I defend a civil lawsuit, something like that, or information on certain types of family law cases, you know, what's, you know, how do I maybe respond to a modification case, you know, what do I got to do to defend myself in that situation. So uh, obviously we're still doing things at a bit of a distance here because of the coronavirus, but um, we are still able to provide you with uh, materials and hopefully we'll get back to being fully open uh, sooner rather than later. Um, I said some other issues, this kind of talks about the petition and the answer, uh, some other issues such as motion to transfer venue, special appearance, and the statute of limitations. You know, statute of limitations uh, is uh, the timeline that someone has to file a lawsuit. You know, it's not open-ended. You know, say you get involved in a car accident. You know, there's a certain amount of time that you generally have to bring, say, a personal injury lawsuit or a breach of contract lawsuit or a fraud case or, or a libel and slander case. You know, there's different statute limitations in the Texas Civil Practice and Remedies Code, Chapter 16, which we, we have in many formats. Um, you know, there's a thing called computation of time. The rules of procedure talk about, you know, how do deadlines, you know, start and end on, on and sort of the parameters of that. You know, how much time do I have to respond to certain things? You know, if I receive something on a Sunday, does Sunday count? So it, it's, you know, there's some particular rules about how you compute time. Uh, and there's a lot of deadlines in civil litigation. Uh, so probably in criminal litigation too. So you gotta you know, avail yourself of that information. Um, you know, there's two different things in, in legal documents, the two general types of legal documents, I would say. Pleadings and discovery. Uh, pleadings are things that are filed with the court, served on other parties. The petition, the answer, the motion, uh, motions to do certain things. Uh, then there's discovery, which are means of gathering information that you serve on other parties. You can send people requests for documents. Uh, you can send them a notice of deposition if you want to take an oral deposition where you, you know, a pretrial uh, questioning under oath of a witness or party. So there's uh, there's those different types of uh, uh, different types of categories. Excuse me for a second. So we've got about 10 more minutes. So we're, we're getting to the quicker part of the program. Um, so that, you know, this is the basic structure of say a legal document. You have uh, you know, like a motion. A motion is used within a case to ask the court to do something. Uh, and so there's just a way of structuring legal documents. And, and I talk about that somewhat in my word class that I give in our express classes on Thursdays. But there's just a you know, general basic format. You have the caption of the case, which gives the case number, the party identification, the case identification. 
You know, you're going to title your motion. You're going to then have the body of it, you know, paragraphs describing, you know, what the situation is, uh, what you want the court to do, and why the court uh, should do what you're asking. What is the legal basis for the court to uh, uh, find in your favor? Uh, you got to sign the document, give your appropriate contact information. Uh, you got to serve the document on the other side, the certificate of service. You got to give fair notice and timely notice to uh, the other side pursuant to the rules of civil procedure. Uh, you know, so you say uh, on this day, I certify that I sent a copy of this document via certified mail to the other side, you know, and that, you know, you're saying I did what I was supposed to do and give the other side notice. You know, then there's the order. You know, when you do a motion to a court, you want to give them an order, a proposed order that would put your uh, request into operative language where the court would say, I agree with what you uh, asked for in your motion and I'm ordering the other party to do this, this and this. Uh, so it kind of tracks the language in your motion. Uh, there's other types of orders as well. A divorce decree is an order, uh, you know, a final judgment in a case. So you win a personal injury case uh, against someone and there's a judgment which describes uh, what is the outcome. You know, uh, this person was found liable in this amount to this other person. Uh, so then there's the notice of hearing. So if you need an oral hearing, uh, you got to give notice. Uh, you got to set it up with the court coordinator and you got to give the other side notice saying uh, at this date, this time, this place, this motion is going to be heard by the court. Um, there's some particular information uh, by the JP courts. Uh, they're governed by rules 500 and 510 of the rules of civil procedure. Uh, there's some particulars in how they do things, so be aware of that. There's some shorter deadlines and, and so forth. Um, if you, if you kind of lose at this level, at the trial court level, there's ways to appeal things. Uh, from the county court at law or from the JP courts, you appeal to the county court at law. From the uh, other courts, you, know, you appeal to the Court of Appeals. Uh, you know, there's deadlines, obviously, once you, you know, something final becomes final in the trial court, you're under, on the clock to determine if you need to do anything following that to file an appeal or something like that. There's always deadlines. Uh, obviously, there's the U.S. Supreme Court, the Texas Supreme Court, uh, the federal court system. So there's, there's different levels of, uh, of things, uh, you know, like in Texas, generally from the trial court to the Court of Appeals to possibly the Texas Supreme Court or the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. Obviously, uh, cases can be appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, though their jurisdiction is very limited or very small. Not, not, I said that wrong. The number of cases they consider each year is relatively small. Um, there's other things you can do post-trial. You know, If you need to make a motion for a new trial, uh, motions to modify the judgment, things like that. There's just some different moves that can be made after a case is over, and there's obviously a timeline and parameters for doing so. Um, so just beware of deadlines always. Uh, so, you know, this kind of talks about some more general information. Fort Bend County website is indispensable. Each, you know, court has their own web, web page within the website. Uh, the district clerk, the county clerks, you know, when you get involved in a case, it's very important that you go on each court's website to look at their particular procedures and so forth, uh, you know, to help you navigate uh, your case through their system as best as possible. Um, finding an attorney, uh, obviously for a criminal case, uh, either hire your own attorney or utilize the indigent defense office. Uh, in a civil case, you know, there's, uh, you can hire your own attorney. Uh, you can try and seek help from legal aid organizations. Uh, there's Lone Star Legal Aid here uh, in Richmond. They have a Richmond office. It's a state organization. Uh, it's a private organization, but it's uh, statewide. Uh, they have an office here in downtown Richmond now, opened up a year or two ago. Um, you know, the Fort Bend County Bar Association, the local practice group, uh, they have a local professional group. They have a bar, a website, fortbendbar.org, and you can search for attorneys via uh, different categories. Uh, there's some other places through the Houston Law Referral Service or the State Bar but to find an attorney. This is just uh, links to some other uh, good websites. Texas Law Help, there at the bottom, we use that a lot to give some standard forms to people, and that's available on anybody's computer. You can utilize that one from home. So a lot of the basic divorce and uh, modification paperwork we use for from Texas Law Help. Um, here's our information, our contact info, uh, Andrew, the uh, law librarian, and me, the assistant. Um, you know, we have a lot of services here. Obviously, we're kind of on hold because of the coronavirus, but when we do fully open, we've got uh, several computers. We've got databases on various computers. We've got books. We've got copiers. We've got a scanner. Uh, we've got meeting rooms and 
and so forth. We've got Wi-Fi. So, it, you know, it's a good full service place, um, you know, places to work, work tables. So I have included a few pictures. Uh, there's our door, uh, kind of the main part of the law library. Some of our meeting rooms and computers and printers. You know, our charges for stuff is relatively modest. You know, we charge about 10 cents a page for copying and printing, uh, more for color, of course, but most of you don't need them. Uh, it's just, you know, our work tables, our copiers, more of our computers, uh, our book collection. You know, we've got a really excellent collection here. It's very uh, broad uh, and in-depth. So we got a, you know, it's a, not a, the biggest physical law library, but it's a, we pack a lot of punch into it. I think it's a, you know, I was a practicing lawyer for many years and just looking at objectively uh, uh, at it as a state, <clears throat> as a, you know, customer of law libraries, uh, it's a really good law library. Um, so I'm, I'm proud to work here. Um, like I said, this is a, a really good place. We've got a good staff. We've got great materials. We're lucky that we have a county like Fort Bend. Uh, that you know the the folks here have provided us uh, with something because it's important to uh, to people uh, to have this kind of uh, resource. I think it's a resource that a lot of people aren't aware of. Uh, hopefully, if it comes to the point where you do need us, we're we're here for you. Uh, like I said, uh, Courthouse 102, the continuation uh, of this course, just goes into a little more detail. You know, I kind of talk about it. And I'll you know if you attend the course, which I'm holding next week. Uh, you know, it's kind of like okay, now I'm in a case. Now what? You know, I can't tell you how to win a case. I can tell you uh, that we have materials that will help you handle your case. Uh, you know, the devil's in the details, and there's a lot of details uh, in 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 the law. Um, it's a bit. Uh, it can be a bit overwhelming for people. I'm sure. Uh, you know, it's hard on lawyers sometimes. So I can only imagine what it feels like as a as a pro se person. It can feel a bit daunting. And so whatever we can do to try and alleviate that, provide information. Uh, provide services and so forth uh, for when you're handling your case. That's uh, what we're here to do. So uh, I would uh, open it up to any questions. If anybody uh, would like to ask a question, obviously you can, I'll send you, I have your emails and I'll send you a copy of the PowerPoint and it will uh, give my contact information and you're welcome to email me or call me and say, Hey, can you send me this form or send me this information or something like that? So uh, thank you for attending, and uh, if there's not any questions, I'll, I'll play. Um, I had a quick question. It's a general question. Yes, Ms. Foster. Um, what happens to cases, like you were talking about, that they can't hold trials right now? What happens to cases when there can't be trials for such a long time? Is there, like, a large backup in the system, or, you know, are the prosecutors trying to make deals with people? What what happens? In a I think... I mean, this is just sort of me speaking off the cuff. I mean, I would think both, you know, I think there is going to be some backup. I would think there's also going to be uh, some moves by uh, folks to try and maybe make some deals to, you know, to try and clear the, the dockets as much as possible. So that wouldn't surprise me if that was what they were doing. Uh, you know, definitely I think there's going to be some backup and the, the courts obviously are trying to handle as much as possible, but a lot of things in the criminal side, let's say have been, they use the terminology reset. So the case gets reset. Uh, so yeah, there is going to be uh, some delays and so forth. And, and, you know, I think there is going to be some backup and I wouldn't be surprised if the, if the district attorney is at least trying to work with folks to, uh, you know, get as many cases resolved uh, outside of trial as possible. I think that's always their goal anyway, especially now under these circumstances. So that's just my thought. I have no idea if that's true or not, but uh, that would be my thought. And it's going to the same way in family law and, uh, you know, and in uh, other types of cases, there's going to be some backlog that's going to have to be gotten through. So, yep. So I think I'm almost out of time. Uh, thank you all very much for attending. It's my privilege to, to teach and thank you much. Thank you, sir.